Well, we continue our studies in John's Gospel. We're turning to John's Gospel, chapter 7. John's Gospel, chapter 7. We are going through, for the sake of our, our visitors, we're going through the Gospel of John, verse by verse. And we are of the conviction uh, in this church that it's the understanding of the Word of God. The Scriptures are able to make us wise unto salvation. And the more we understand uh, the Scripture, and especially the more we understand Christ as He is revealed in the Scripture, the more we will know and understand the salvation of God. So we're looking at uh, five verses this morning, John chapter 7 and verses 40 to 44. So let us just uh, read those verses. We're entitling our message this morning, Divided because of Christ. Divided because of Christ. John chapter 7 and verses 40 to 44. Many of the people therefore, when they heard this saying, said, Of a truth, this is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him. And some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. And so reads the word of God to us. I remember many years ago, seeing a gospel tract. And the title of it was, or the title of it was, Christ the Great Divider. Christ the Great Divider. I believe that the the text of scripture that the tract was based on was not this one that we just read, but a very similar one to it. And that is in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 34, where the Lord Jesus gives uh, clarification to the purpose of his ministry. The sad fact is that so many people have wrong views of Christ. They see Christ as, you know, a, a good teacher, which he was, but much more than that. They see Christ as somebody who came just to speak nice words, but yet the Lord Jesus in John chapter 10 corrects that notion when he says, think not. Don't make the mistake that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. You can believe in a false Christ and be the friends of men. But when you believe in the true Christ, the Christ of Scripture, you will become the enemies of many. The Lord Jesus in another place tells his disciples that if men hate you, do not be surprised. Just remember that they hated me first. And the closer we are to Christ... And the more faithfully we follow him, the more we shall be despised by the world. If it is our desire to be popular, to be liked, well then, following Christ will never achieve that aim. There is the cost, isn't there? In Mark chapter 8, I believe, or is it chapter 10, it talks about The cost of discipleship. Counting the cost of being a disciple 
of Jesus Christ. In Luke chapter 12 and verse 49, the Lord Jesus says, this is the comparative text from Matthew, I am come to send fire on the earth. And what will I if it be already kindled? The Lord Jesus did not come to be a friendly sort of encourager, even though he is the greatest friend and the greatest encourager. But he came to make a division, and that is seen in its ultimate expression on the cross. It's not just a coincidence that while Christ hung on the cross, you see that division between the one who went to hell and the one who went to heaven on either side of him. The one who realized the grace of God in Christ Jesus. The one who realized the lordship and kingship of Christ. And the one who just mocked. The one who saw nothing in Christ to be honored. Nothing to be worshipped. So the title of our message is very appropriate. Divided because, and again, I, I was, I, I carefully included that word, because of Christ. We will be divided from the world if we follow him. In fact, it's something you won't even have to choose to do. They will make the choice. The world will make the choice for you. In fact, so often we, we don't want to be divided from our friends, from our family. But they are the ones who divide themselves from us. We see this at the end of John 6, don't we? After the Lord Jesus teaches, he does not walk away from his disciples, but they walk away from him. In verse 66 of that chapter. Divided because of Christ. We have three opinions of the Lord Jesus. Everybody, I would suggest has an opinion of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in this text this morning, we have at least three opinions expressed. We have the opinion of many in verse 40, the opinion of what what the text calls others in verse 41, and then the opinion of some at the end of 41 and 42. And then in verse 43, we have Christ, the cause of division, and in verse 44, The intent of some. So first of all, the opinion of the many. The opinion of the many. Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said of a truth, this is the prophet. A.W. Pink, commenting on this verse, says, The line of thought found in this verse And the 12 verses that follow it might be termed the testing of men by the truth and their failure to receive it. This world, in the thought of A.W. Pink, is being faced with a test. In the Garden of Eden, the test was a command. A command not to eat of the forbidden fruit. But now the test has changed. The test is no longer a tree and fruit. The test is now man's view of Christ. What think ye of Christ is the great test. Now the fact is that every man, woman and child will fail that test apart from the sovereign grace of God. But that is the test. We see that test revealed here in this passage. And we see that man left to himself will believe anything but what the truth is regarding Christ. Notice, first of all, the sheer number uh, mentioned here. Many of the people, therefore. Many of the people. Christ affects the many. He comes to divide and he comes to bring himself to the attention of man. And man cannot avoid him. So many people had an opinion. 
the sad reality is in our society today, especially in this island, that most people's opinion of Christ is he's not worthy of our thoughts. We will not have this man to reign over us. That's the opinion today. We do not want Christ. We will not have him as our king. In fact, for the Jewish people, they were even prepared to have Caesar instead of Christ. Caesar is our king, they cried out at Christ's crucifixion. Away with this man, crucify him. And isn't it strange that the world is more willing to submit to Satan or any wicked ruler than it is to submit to Christ? This shows the sinfulness of our hearts. It shows the wickedness and depravity of our hearts. But then secondly, the cause of their opinion. It says when they heard this saying, what saying? Well, it's referring back to verses 37 uh, to 39 that we looked at two Lord's days ago. In verse 37, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And notice the challenge there. The challenge to faith. The challenge to believe. And when you call on someone to believe and to trust, then the the obvious thing is, well, what is the person? Who is this person? What is he saying? And therefore, you have these opinions expressed in the text. But then thirdly, their conclusion They said of a truth that this is the prophet. Well, what does it mean when it says this is the prophet? Well, it's referring back to Deuteronomy chapter 18. Just turn there with me for a moment. Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 15. Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 15. This is Moses speaking. And in verse 15 we read of Deuteronomy 18, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee of thy brethren like unto me. Unto him ye shall hearken. Then down down to verse 18, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee and will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. Now in the Jewish mindset, and it's proven actually in our text, that there was this prophet that's referred to here by Moses, who was obviously referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. But in the Jewish mindset, this prophet was distinct from the Christ. So they believed in uh, some other individual that would be raised up. And uh, biblical commentators would be um, agreed that it's referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. And in our text we see back in John chapter 7 that this group is distinguished from those who would say, no, this is the Christ. This is very appropriate in our modern day because we have... That so-called great religion, Islam, who refers to the Lord Jesus Christ as a prophet. But that's not enough. It's not enough to see the Lord Jesus Christ as a prophet. In fact, the Lord Jesus, speaking of John the Baptist, said that he was more than a prophet. And John the Baptist said of himself that he was not worthy even to unloose the sandals. Of the Lord Jesus Christ. What a contrast. The greatest of all prophets. The one who was even more than a prophet. We've no title for that description really. 
the Lord describes something that in a negative or in a positive, yes, but doesn't give a name. And yet this one, not worthy to bow before Christ. So it's not enough to acknowledge Christ as a prophet. He's much more. He is the king. He is the Lord of glory. Paul calls him that in Corinthians, doesn't he? Had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. I was listening to a a message by Martin Lloyd-Jones in the last couple of days. It's on Ephesians chapter 1. It's his fifth message in that that series, in that book. And, And he makes the point that a Christian, a true Christian, is set apart, I'm not quoting uh, word for word here, but a true Christian is set apart by the views that he has or the, the opinion or the view that he has of God. So many of us live on the basis of just concentrating on ourselves. I've had a good week. I've had a bad week. I haven't done too bad or I haven't done too good. And all the thoughts are about self. And Martin Lloyd-Jones says that a true Christian is really set apart by thinking about God. His mind being fixed on his God. Worshipping his God. Thanking his God. Glorying in his God. To bring us back to it. Psalm 120 that we sang and read. Sometimes God will bring us into real distress just so we will focus completely on him. Psalm 130 as well. Out of the depths have I cried unto thee. Sometimes we have to be brought right down into the very pit. Just so in one sense We will forget about ourselves and concentrate on our need for God. We have that wonderful passage in Isaiah 6. In the the year that King Uzziah died and everybody lost hope. 55 years Uzziah on the throne and he was seen as as the hope of the people of the southern kingdom. He dies. And Isaiah says he has that vision of the Lord, high and exalted. The great problem, we see this even in America now, don't we? People think, and even many evangelical Christians think, well, you know, what's the better option and so on? And neither option is good, we know that. But the real problem is, even if there was someone better, that's not where we should be putting our hope. Trust not in man. Trust not in princes. Don't even trust in the best of men. Put your trust in the Lord. And the reason why the the nations in this part of the world have fallen from the place where they were, and they were great nations, But the reason for their greatness was the trust that there was in Christ. Not in all the people, but even in some of the people. Their views of God. Their views of Christ, which were glorious views, which were much more than he was a prophet. Maybe some of these people thought that they were being generous to Christ. Maybe they thought they were paying him a compliment, giving him honor, but they were diminishing his glory. They were diminishing his glory. The church needs to get back to owning him as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and trusting in his kingship and trusting in his power and his sovereignty the one who sustains all things by the very word of his power so 
So where is your mind in relation to him? What have you been thinking about in, in, in the last week? Your troubles, your successes, whatever. And how much thoughts have you had on the greatness of Jesus Christ? On the glory of God? Because that will become the guide and the, and the rule and the, the temperature, if you like, of your life. Great thoughts of Christ will lead to great lives for Christ. It's not about just living a good life. Many of these Jews lived what we might call a decent life. The Pharisee gloried in the fact that he was not like other men. But one thing that they lacked, the one thing that was needful, to use the words of Luke 10, was they did not see in Christ all their sufficiency. He's much more than a prophet. So this opinion is wrong. And then moving on to the, to the second, which was the genuine and true opinion, others said, this is the Christ. Now, what you notice between this opinion and the one that precedes it and the one that follows it is its brevity. Do you see what I'm saying? The, the previous one takes up a whole verse and the following one uh, a verse and a bit. Others said, this is the Christ. Do you know when we come to know who he truly is, that's it. I think there's, a, there's, there's this implicit in this distinction, in the very brevity of those who concluded, no, 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 he's not just a prophet. He's not just a good teacher. He's not just a rabbi. This is the Christ. This is the Messiah. This is the one whom God has promised. Since the very garden. So when Peter, when Jesus in Matthew 16 comes to the coasts of Caesarea Philippi and asks his disciples saying, Whom do men say that I the son of man am? See that's what matters. It's our view, it's our opinion of Christ that matters. Nothing else matters. The day of judgment will all be about what is our opinion of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias or Elijah and others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. There was lots of different opinions. And then he turns to the disciples and says, but who... Do ye say that I am? What's your opinion of me? And you know, the Lord Jesus says that to each one of you this morning. See, it really doesn't matter on one level how wrecked your life is. How sinful your mind is. But what matters what really, really matters is your view of Jesus Christ. Is your opinion of him. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And this condemns Islam, and Judaism, and every religion that will not bow the Lordship of Christ that will not acknowledge him him alone thou art the Christ the son of the living God Jesus answered and said unto him blessed art thou Simon bar Jonah you didn't come up with this yourself you didn't conclude this by your own human wisdom. Flesh and blood has not revealed it to thee, but my Father which is in heaven. 
Dear friends, we will never have right opinions of Christ unless God reveals it to us. We will never have a right opinion of him except it be revealed to us from God the Father. Back again in John 6, when the Lord Jesus says to his disciples, to the twelve, will you also go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. See, Peter had many faults, many mistakes, many sins. Even with regard to the person of the Lord Jesus, he was a coward, wasn't he? And not just before the resurrection, but even after the resurrection in Galatians 2. He was afraid at times of men. Afraid to offend. Afraid to be offended. And yet, in the midst of all this, God reveals to his heart. Not just the belief that Jesus is the Christ, but the absolute conviction that he is the Christ. How sure, how sure are you this morning of the Christ? Martha was the same, wasn't she? Look at chapter 11 of John and verse 20. John chapter 11 and verse 20. We know the context, it's the Lazarus has died. And Martha in verse 20, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, which wasn't normal because she was the sister of the man who died and it would, be an, it would have been appropriate, it would have been proper for her just to stay mourning, surrounded by all the, the mourners and so on. And yet at the moment she hears, which is a wonderful act of faith, in other words, she drops all the social etiquette to meet with Christ. She drops all the expectation of men just so she can go to be with Jesus. Nothing else matters to her but to see him. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. She knew that Christ makes all the difference. The difference not just between circumstance, but the very difference between life and death. Lord, if you had been here, if you had been just present, he wouldn't have died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, thy brother shall rise again, Martha. Saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Jesus said unto her, and he's going to correct and, and focus our theology here. Again, to emphasize the importance on focusing on the person of Christ, not just the events. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. Much more than a prophet. Much more than a prophet. I am the resurrection. And the life, he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And I I love then this application. Believest thou this? Martha, do you believe? Do you actually not just comprehend what I'm saying, but do you apprehend? Do you take hold of what I'm saying? Are you resting not just in the facts of me, but in me, myself, personally? And she couldn't give a better answer. She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which shall come into the world. And this is what will make the difference, not just in this world, Between the saved and the lost, but on the day of judgment. Between those who will be condemned and those who will be accepted. Back in our text in John 7, the opinion of some. Some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? And the one thing you'll notice here, let me only speak briefly on this point. But I think the key point here is at the end of verse 41 and verse 42, is that Partial knowledge is dangerous. 
I'll see if you get the point before I say any more. Shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? You see, they only had partial knowledge. Yes, he was raised in Nazareth. But he was of the seed of David and he was of Bethlehem. They didn't know that. Partial knowledge of Christ is dangerous. That's why we must meditate on the word of God about him. That's why we must hungrily search the word of God to know him more and more. To know Christ as he is revealed in the scripture. There's an absolute relationship between our meditation on the word of God and our knowledge of him and our honoring of him. An absolute relationship. I remember many years ago having a sort of a debate with a number of believers And really the point was this, can we separate the written word from the living word? Can we separate the scripture from Christ? And the obvious answer is no. And we cannot know Christ apart from the word of God. You see, knowledge of Christ according to the scripture is a knowledge of the facts of what the scripture says about Christ. Because if you have a Christ, and doesn't Paul say to the Corinthians, if somebody brings another Jesus, I fear that you will too easily accept him. You're so childish in your understanding, and so infantile in your understanding of the faith, that if somebody brings a different Jesus, I just think you'll, you'll all too easily let him into the church. We cannot separate the word of God, the written word of God from the living word of God. This is the problem with the modern charismatic Pentecostal movement. Put so much emphasis on feelings, experiences. Yes, we want the experience. Yes, we want the feelings, but they must come out of scripture. We all mourn the fact when we're we're living lives that are defeated unvictorious and we don't have a sense of God and the presence of God but the only way to to realize that is to be in the word of God meditating on the word of God and the power of the spirit so the modern church not only separates Christ from his word but separates the spirit from his word I always recommend to Pentecostal people, read John 14, 15, and 16 and and read what it says about the Spirit of God. Read what it says about the Spirit of God. He will not speak of himself. I think it's chapter 16. Is it in verse 9? This is a slight deviation, but let me just do it for a moment. John chapter uh, 16, is it? And uh, John chapter 16 Verse 13, actually, it is. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. There's one aspect of the spirit. The second aspect in verse 14, he shall glorify me. He will always exalt Christ. So We have a wonderful, and this ties in back into the message. When it's our desire to exalt Christ, we are in perfect unison with the Holy Spirit. Because it's the Holy Spirit's desire to exalt Christ, to promote Christ. And when we're promoting Christ, and it's the Father's desire, this is my beloved Son, hear Him. So we have the Father promoting Christ. We have the Spirit promoting Christ. And when we as believers seek to exalt Christ, we are in unison with the Father and the Spirit. The Lord Jesus said, when I shall be exalted, when I shall be lifted up, I shall draw all men unto me. That's the great calling. Of this church. The great calling of this church is not to be Reformed Baptists, is it? The great calling of this church is to exalt Jesus Christ, to worship Jesus Christ, to promote Jesus Christ, 
to proclaim Jesus Christ. That is the calling of this church. That is the mission of this church. And that is the mission of every believer. In the words of Alan Martin, we can become respectable Reformed Baptists and go to hell. It's possible to be a respectable Reformed Baptist and not be saved. For not loving Christ and not honoring Christ. And lastly, sorry, not lastly, second last, (laughs) verse 43, Christ the cause of division. Christ the cause of division. Verse 43, so there was a division among the people. And just in case you thought that my title was unbiblical, there was a division among the people because of him. It was because of him. In 1 Corinthians 11, we don't have time to turn there, but in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 17 to 19, Paul refers to the divisions that he'd heard, and he says, Doubtless there must be factions or or heresies, as it says in the AV, among you to show which of you has God's approval. Christ is in the constant work of dividing. You see, Christianity is not a cake. You're saying, where's he going with that one? Christianity is not a cake. What do you do with a cake? You get all the ingredients and you put them in together and you make the cake. That's not Christianity. It's a nice cake, but it's not Christianity. Christianity is about making divisions between light and darkness, between righteousness and wickedness, between Christ and the world. We must be separate because of him. Because it is his mission. It's his mission to divide. It says on the day of judgment that when he comes, he will sit and divide the the, the sheep from the goats. Never. Never has the church been so in love with the idea of ecumenism. So in love with the idea of let's just all get together. Never. In the history of the church, has the church been so much in disagreement with Jesus Christ? Never in the history of Christianity has Christianity been so opposed to Jesus Christ. Isn't that true? Because the lie of ecumenism, the lie of false unity, the lie that doctrine doesn't really matter, the lie that the Reformation was a mistake, The lie that God doesn't really care about what you think and what you believe. That's exactly what God cares about. That's exactly what matters. It's your opinion and your doctrine of Christ. That's what matters. Think about this. Think back to when you were a young believer. You were fired up with doctrine. Especially doctrines about Christ. The deity of Christ. The majesty of Christ. The glory of Christ. But after a while, sometimes these things become less important. And that's why we grow stale, isn't it? It's when we are fired up. I met a believer in um, a bookshop during the week. Uh, In fact, myself, Colette and Catherine, I think it was, met this believer. And if I can say, this believer, he, 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 I think he knows this, if I can say this, You know, he's not completely psychologically sound. He's not just, you know, 100% all there. And I don't say that in any sort of derogatory sense. But I'll say this about him. He loves Christ. He glories in Christ. He rejoices in Christ. And he showed me a book about the Lord. And he's read it eight times. And he's marked so much you can barely see the print on the book anymore. And he loves the Savior. And I I just got excited listening to him. And I would rather be in his presence, though he's not just, as I've already said, than these sort of, you know, highly educated so-called Christians who would, instead of firing you up for Christ, would make you fall asleep. We need to get back to our first love. We need to get back to loving Christ. We need to get back to loving the Bible. We need to get back to loving 
all those thoughts that the scripture would present before us to give us wonderful and majestic and beautiful thoughts of him. How does the New Testament end? Even so, come Lord Jesus. A.W. Pink, quoting on this, said, How senseless it is, this modern talk of the union of Christendom. Fellow preacher, if you are faithfully declaring all the counsel of God, be not surprised nor be dismayed if there's a division because of you. Listen to what he says. Regard it as an ominous sign, if it be otherwise. As believers, we're not called to be popular. We're not called to be popular. But we are called to be faithful. Thankfully, we're not even called to be successful. It's not an encouragement. Christ does not judge us on the basis of the numbers that listen to us. But only on one thing shall we be judged. Were we faithful to him who called us? Did we remain true to him and his gospel? That's all that matters. I stand before you this morning as one who has lots of faults, lots of sins. The one thing I pray that will never change by God's grace, and that is my view of Christ. I have very low views of myself, and that's good, isn't it? But you see, that alone, to have very low views of yourself and and no more, because there's lots of people in the world outside of Christ who have low opinions of themselves, and that just makes them depressed. (laughs) That just makes them sad and, and makes many of them commit suicide, doesn't it? Because all they have is depression for the Christian. When we have those depressing thoughts, oh, how we need Christ. To deliver us from ourselves. How we need Christ to deliver us from the, the sadness that is, that is normal for our fallen humanity. So the world, the world just tries to put a band-aid on a, a mortal wound. We need him. You see, we need nothing less than him. Nothing less than Christ for a fallen sinner. Nothing less than Christ for, for one who, who can never overcome their own sin. Who can never live one day without feeling the weight of sin upon us. Nothing less. A prophet is not good enough. A good teacher is not good enough. We need the Christ. Lord, if you had been here... My brother had not died. But here's the wonderful truth. Christ is here with us. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. He that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. To possess Christ is to possess everything. Read Colossians in your own time. If you haven't read Colossians... Recently, read the four chapters of Colossians and read it with this view, the all-sufficiency of Christ. He is all that we need. For in Him is comprehended everything that is needed for life and godliness. Just turn there for a moment. Colossians. Chapter 1, verse 15, who is the image of the invisible God. In other words, the, the, the idea there in verse 15 is God is invisible. But when God is visible, it's Christ. That's what it's, that's what it's saying, isn't it? God is invisible, but when God is made visible, what do you see? Christ. He's the firstborn of the preeminent one of every creature. 
For by him are all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. He is the all-sufficient one. When you have Christ, you have everything. Well then lastly, in verse 44, the intention of some. Listen, what's the point of verse 44? When you can't win the argument, just kill, just, you know, act physically. Some people do that, don't they? They're they're not clever enough to win the argument, so they strike out. That's exactly what verse 44 is saying. They knew they couldn't win the argument. They saw the evidence. They saw, yes, this has to be the Christ. In John chapter 3, we know that you are from God, Nicodemus says. And he's speaking on behalf of the Sanhedrin. We know that you're from God, for no man can do the things that you do except God be with him. Some of them, verse 44, would have taken him. They wanted, the Greek means that was their greatest desire. That was their inmost desire. Quite often we look at people, we can't tell what they're thinking, we can't tell what they're desiring. Imagine being the Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 2 when he says that he knew what was in a man. He did not need for, for anyone to tell him what man was like, for he knew what was in a man. Imagine being the Lord Jesus Christ surrounded by many people and he knew what was in them. He knew what was in their hearts. He was looking at people's faces knowing that they desired to kill him. We could not operate in that circumstance, could we? For three years he looked into the face of Judas knowing what Judas would do. But listen to what A.W. Pink, I want to close with this this quote. Listen to what he says on, on this verse. Men may boast of their willpower and their free will. In other words, what they want to do. But after all, what does it amount to? Pilate said, Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee and have power to release thee? He boasted because he really believed this. But what was our Lord's answer? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all except It were given thee from above. It was so here. These men desired to arrest Christ. But they were not given power from above to do so. Verily or truly we may say. We may say with the prophet of old. O Lord I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. End quote. Listen. Brethren, the victory of our faith is this. The Christ that we believe in is in total control of all that happens. That's the all-sufficiency. That Romans 8.28 tells us that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. The Christ that you believe in, the Christ that you trust in, is the Christ that will keep you in his hands. And no one, John chapter 10, can remove you from the hands of the Good Shepherd. No one. Trust in him. Place your confidence in him. For greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. There's only one opinion that matters. It's the opinion that he is the Christ, that he is the Son of God, that he is the Good Shepherd, that he is the King. May God bless his word to our souls. Amen. Let us sing from Psalm 71. We shall be partaking of the Lord's table. After this, all true believers... 
who've been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ are welcome to join with us for the table of the Lord. And we'll sing uh, this. We'll stand to sing Psalm 71. Then we'll have a word of prayer. And then we'll just have a few moments to get to prepare uh, for the Lord's table. Let's stand to sing Psalm 71. And we'll sing verses 1 to 5. Psalm 71, verses 1 to 5. O Lord, my hope and confidence is placed in Thee alone. Then let Thy servant never be put to confusion. And let me in Thy righteousness from that as we have meditated upon the Lord Jesus in the message this morning, that we will be enabled to see in the sacrament of the bread and wine the Lord Jesus broken for us, that we would glory in the cross of Jesus Christ, and that we would find in him all that we need, all that is sufficient to be acceptable in the sight of a holy God. Bless us, we pray in the Savior's name. Amen.